Because I live, ye shall live also. Because I live, ye shall live also. I'm sure most of us know where this is uh, taken from. But after telling his disciples that he will, he's, he's going to go, he will go away and send them the comforter. Jesus in John chapter 14, come with me to John chapter 14. He tells them something. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 18. And Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. Now here Jesus is linking two events to us living also. Number one, I will come to you. That's his coming to us. And the second one is because I live. He's referring to his resurrection. So he, Jesus is referring to his resurrection and his coming to us to this state that he calls ye shall live also. Because I live, ye shall live also. Now what, what, what did Jesus mean by ye shall live also? And how is this life related to his resurrection and his coming to us? For us to understand what he meant by it, we have to understand what he's talking about. What kind of life is he talking about when he says, because I live, ye shall live also. I mean, what do you mean, Lord? I was alive. If I was among the disciples, I mean, I wouldn't help knowing me. I'm outspoken. I wouldn't help but asking Jesus, what do you mean, Lord? I'm alive already. What do you mean I shall live? I'm alive already. I believe that when Jesus said, because I live, ye shall live also, he was not referring to their probationary life, to their physical life that everybody lives. I don't believe he was even referring to a life that begins and they will live after their resurrection, after his second coming. I don't believe that. I believe he's referring to a life that they will live that is based, related to his resurrection and his coming back. We will see, we will see more of it soon. But I want you to notice now, I'm going to read this text in context, beginning from verse 12. I want you to notice the future tense that Jesus is referring to. Beginning at verse 12 of John chapter 14. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my father. my father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter future now remember that the, the time when jesus spoke these things he has not died yet right he's still with them and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you future i will not leave you comfortless i will come to you future Yet a little while, that is future, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. Future. At that day, that's verse 20. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. At what day? At the day that I go unto the Father, that the other comforter comes. At the day when he will come. He shall be in you, the comforter, at the day when I come to you, and at the day when ye shall live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. Alright, so this type of life that Jesus was talking about begins on the day when he comes to us. When the comforter comes to us. In that day, when he, the comforter, is in you. When I will come to you, when I will be in you. In that day, you will know. And in that day, because I live, ye shall live also. We'll see more of it now. So he was not referring to something. He was referring rather to something they did not have as of yet. But they shall have. Right? They did not have it. But he told them, look, yet a little while from now. Because I live, ye shall live. He will come in you, the comforter. I will come to you, ye shall live also. Jesus was talking about something that is to happen in the future. Now notice that not everybody will receive this thing 
or person or whatever it is will see later that he's talking about what she calls a comforter. He says, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So you, as a believer of Christ, you will receive something that Jesus calls a comforter that the world does not have and cannot receive. Yes? All right, I want you to keep that in mind because you will refer to it later. Now, the comforter that Jesus was talking about, this life that Jesus was talking about, I would like to put to you that this was not available before he died, rose, and went to his father. I'll repeat that. What Jesus was talking about, the comforter or the spirit of truth, was not available to anybody before Christ died, rose, and went to his father. Why do I say that? Come with me to John chapter 7, beginning at verse 38. John chapter 7, beginning at verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John commenting now and he says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So when Jesus said, if you believe on me, you will receive something that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. John tells us, okay, what Jesus was talking about in it, he was referring to the spirit that will be given. Because that spirit is not yet, has not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, I acknowledge that the word given there, the spirit was not yet given. The word given is in italic. That means it's added. But the meaning is clearly implied in the text. It says the spirit was not yet because Jesus was not yet what? So the giving of this spirit is dependent on what? The glorification of Jesus. The spirit would not be given until Jesus is glorified. Come with me to John chapter 16. Another text that says similar thing, but from a different angle. John chapter 16. And verse 7. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Amen. Don't be afraid to say amen. <laughs> Let me know. John chapter 16 and verse 7. And Jesus again here speaking, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go on and away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. If I don't go away, the comforter will not come. That means the comforter has not come yet. At the time when he was speaking these words, right? Now, who is the comforter? The Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John chapter 14, uh, the, he calls it the spirit of truth. In verse 26, he says, But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Mm -hmm. So the comforter is a spirit that the Father will send in my name. Come, come with me to... We'll, we'll wait for that. We'll, we'll deal with this a bit later on. So again, the same point is brought out in this verse. That the comforter will not come until I go away. The spirit was not yet until Jesus was glorified. Jesus leaving to his father, Jesus glorified. The spirit will not be given until Jesus is, uh, is glorified. Comforter will not come until I go. He's talking about the same thing, right? Because the comforter is the spirit. There's a link there. Now, what is spirit? The word spirit, when the Bible uses the word spirit, what is it talking about? The comforter, the comforter yes. Yeah. Uh, in Luke chapter 23, you don't have to go there, you all know the text. Uh, verse 46, when Jesus was on the cross, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. spirit. And having said this, he gave up the, the ghost or spirit. Spirit meaning? Life. What did he give up? He gave up his life. When Jesus raised up the ruler's daughter, she was dead. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 8, verse 55, and her spirit came again. And she came to life. So what did come back? What came back in her? Spirit or life? It's the same thing, right? It's, uh, Stephen, when he was being stoned, he looked up to heaven and he said, that's in Acts chapter 7, verse 59, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my life. So spirit equals life. Holy Spirit equals holy life. 
All right. We're just letting the Bible interpret itself. And the breath of God. And the breath of God. Yes. So let, let's just review what we saw so far. The comforter is referred to as spirit or life because the spirit is life. And breath. And breath. Jesus told his disciples that they will live a special type of life when he comes back to them. Right? When, or when they receive the comforter. Because I live, ye shall live. We saw that this life or spirit or comforter or breath was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. We also saw that this life begins when the comforter or the spirit or life comes to the disciples. It begins then. And we also saw that not everybody will receive this life or spirit or comforter. Right? We're just letting the scripture interpret itself. Now, when Jesus told the disciples, because I live, ye shall live also. What type of life was he referring to? Spirit life? Eternal life. Notice, in John chapter 10, verse 27. Come with me to John chapter 10, verse 27. I told you we'll be looking at a lot of verses, so keep your fingers warm. <laughs> a lot of them will be from the book of John. So John chapter 10, beginning at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So I give unto them eternal life. In John chapter 3, verse 36, He that believeth on the, th on the Son hath eternal life. Notice, notice the tense. It doesn't say will have. He that believes on the Son hath eternal life. The, the, the Bible doesn't write things, uh, you know, by mistake. They forgot to put the future tense or the past. No, no, no. It, it writes, it means what it says. John chapter 5 verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Two more verses. John chapter 6 verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me. That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. And last verse in John chapter 6 verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on Me, what? Hath, hath everlasting life. I mean, over and over again, Jesus emphasized that He will give eternal life to those who believe on Him. Not only that, but those who believe on Him have already have eternal life. I mean, everybody he spoke to, everybody that read these words at that time is dead now. But the scripture says they had eternal life, not will have. Right? If you want to interpret that scripture, that's what the scripture says. So when Jesus says, because I live, ye shall live also, he was referring to this eternal life they are going to live here on planet Earth earth okay it, it, it sounds like man this is crazy they have eternal life they are living eternal life that yet they are all dead what is the scripture talking about in here we can't throw the verses out because they don't make, se make sense to us so we got to understand them that is why because of what jesus said because of what jesus gave the apostles and all those who believe in him john could tell us in first john chapter 5 come with me to first john Chapter 5 and verse 13. John is writing here and he says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye what? Have, have eternal. eternal life. And the, that ye may know that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I mean, it can't get any clearer, right? <laughs> I'm writing these things unto you, John says, you who believe on the name of the Son of God, so you can know something. I want you to know, I want you to understand that you have eternal life. Okay. So now we understand what type of life Jesus was referring to when he said, I will give you life and because I live, you shall live. We know it's talking about eternal life. But the question that I'd like us to look at, a few questions actually, is number one, do we really, literally, receive something from the outside in, from outside of us that we did not have before when we believe on Jesus? Yes. Do we really literally 
That's number one. Number two, and if we do, what or who is that spirit that we receive? What or who is that spirit that we receive? And number three, how is all this related to Jesus' resurrection, going to the Father in glorification and coming to us? Because he said, unless I go to the Father, the Comforter cannot come. He's, the Bible tells us that the Spirit was not yet because Jesus was not yet glorified. So this life that we are living now is uh, very related to his death, resurrection, going to the Father, glorification and coming back to us. Amen. We'll get to that. <coughs> You're going to make my sermon very short. <laughs> All right. Now, the first question is first. Do we really, literally receive something from outside of us that we did not have before and that the unbelievers do not have? Or is it just a metaphorical thing? I believe that we literally receive someone or something. We'll look at that later. When we accept Jesus, we literally receive from outside of us something or someone we did not have before we receive. And I believe through the couple of messages this morning, it will become clear. I believe that when Jesus says, I will give you the comforter and the comforter will be in you. I believe this is literal. It's not metaphorical. I believe when Jesus said, I will come to you. And when he said, I in you, I believe this to be literal, not metaphorical. Okay, now this was clearly demonstrated on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus told the, the disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from J Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Jesus told them, listen, I want you to wait. Wait for something because you don't have this thing yet. I want you to wait for it until you receive this promise or the Holy Spirit from the Father, which you will be baptized with. So up till that time, they have not received what they received on the day of Pentecost. Because Jesus told them, wait, you will receive it. A few days later, in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 2, we read, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now God demonstrated the reception of the Holy Spirit physically for a reason. He physically showed that they received something from outside in. He demonstrated that, like tongues of fire. Now, of course, the Spirit is not a tongue of fire. No. But God physically illustrated it for a reason. One of them is to show all the Jews that are rejecting that. Hang on a second. These people, there is something to what they are saying. The Messiah is, Jesus is truly the Messiah. But another reason is for us today to understand, to comprehend that when you receive the Spirit, you receive something from outside in. You don't already possess it. And it just transfers from one part of your body to another. No. You receive something from outside in. Okay? Another story is in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 beginning at verse 2. That's Paul was going and he met these uh, 12 missionaries that they were preaching. And Paul in verse 2 he asked them, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since he believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Jump to verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And they spake with tongues and prophesied. So here we see again, God demonstrating this, that they received something from outside. And I mean, there are many other stories in the book of Acts, but I just used two. To demonstrate that when people received Jesus, they received something or someone from outside in. Literally. Right? Now why am I emphasizing this point? It's because I want us to understand that when Jesus said the comforter will be in you, he meant that we literally will receive 
something or someone in us. Amen. It's not a metaphorical thing. It's not just some, it's not a metaphorical. It's literally, Jesus said, the comforter shall be in you. He said, I in you. And many other verses that we'll see later. So literally, something or someone will come from the outside in. So the answer to our question is yes, we do receive somebody, someone or something from outside in. Now this leads us to the second question. Who is this spirit that we receive? Because we receive the Holy Ghost, right? We receive the spirit of truth. We receive the comforter. Well, who or what is this? Who or what is the spirit of truth? Come back with me to John chapter 14. We're going to do an exercise in here. Uh, I wish I had a PowerPoint or a board to illustrate it, but nonetheless, I think it should be clear. In John chapter 14, because Jesus in there, he said, I will pray the Father and he shall give you what? Another comforter. So, most people, when they read this, another, what does another mean? It means another. Somebody else. Sorry? A second person. Well, it, yeah, that people think, well, there you go. It's another it means... It doesn't necessarily mean that it's like another glass of water. Same, same water, but refilled with the same stuff. I know what you mean. But usually people, when they read this text, another, there you go, it's another comforter. It's not Jesus, it's another comforter. Well, what I want us to do now is, just look at this passage, and I want you in your mind to visualize this. Visualize a line in between, two sides. One title is Jesus, one title is the Holy Ghost. I'm going to read the verses and point out what refer goes under Jesus, what goes under the Spirit, and you analyze it for yourself. In verse 19, Jesus said, The world seeth me no more. Right? This goes under Jesus. In verse 17, The world seeth him, the Comforter, not. Right? You follow me? In verse 19, but you see me. Talking about himself, Jesus. Verse 17, but you know him. The comforter. Remember, Jesus was with them at that time, right? He was speaking the words. In verse 17, talking about the comforter, he, he says, he dwelleth with you. Jesus was with them. Talking about the comforter, he said, he dwelleth with you. In verse 20, Jesus says, I in you. And you in me. Yes, but I in you. I in you. verse 17, talking about the comforter, what did he say? He shall be where? In you. In verse 18, Jesus says, I will come to you. In verse 16, talking about the comforter, Jesus says, I will give you another comforter. And in Matthew 28, 19, we don't have to go there. We all know the text. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In verse 16 of John 14, talking about the comforter, he may abide with you forever. I mean, if you just do this exercise, you put a list there, you will see that Jesus was talking about himself in a third person. When the Son of Man cometh, ye shall see... Who was he talking about? Who is the Son of Man? He didn't say, when I come. He said, when the Son of Man come. We don't take this to mean somebody else will come. It's Jesus talking in the third person. He was doing the exact same thing in John chapter 14. Calling himself the comforter. The world does not see him. You will not see me. The world, cannot, uh, the world does not know him. The world does not know me. He will come to you. I will come to you. He will be in you. I will be in you. And so forth. I mean... He was talking about himself, but that's not all. That's not all. Notice what he says in John chapter, uh, in John chapter 14, we, we're there, verse 26. He says, But the Comforter, which is who? The Holy, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Comforter is what? Is a, is a spirit, is the Holy Spirit that will come, will be sent from? The Father. Notice what Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. Come with me to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. Keep in mind, the Spirit, the Holy, the Comforter is a Spirit that will be sent from the Father. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. Notice what Paul says. Because you are sons. 
And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your... Here is a spirit that is sent by the Father. Jesus says, Jesus says, the comforter is the spirit that the Father will send. Paul tells us, because your sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, calling Abba, Father. So who is the comforter? It is the spirit of Jesus. It is Jesus himself. In spirit form. But, okay, but, but I'm, I'm allowing for people that will take it step at a time. But hang on a second. The spirit of Jesus is not Jesus, somebody will say. Well, let's, let's, let's look at some verses. In Mark chapter 2, come with me to Mark chapter 2. <coughs> I want to see, is the spirit of Jesus, Jesus himself, or is it another being other than Jesus? Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they saw reason within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Question. When Jesus perceived in his spirit, who perceived? Jesus or some other being called his spirit? Jesus. It's common sense. Right? It, I mean, the question is, is, is so simple. It's so silly that people look at you like, are you for real? Are you for real asking this question? When the text actually says in his spirit, it could have easily have said in the spirit which he shares with his father. Hmm. But, but uh, yes, and what I'm trying to imply is that when, Jesus, uh, when the Bible says Jesus perceived in his spirit, it's talking about himself. He perceived, sure. not somebody else. Mark chapter 8 verse 12. Mark chapter 8 verse 12. And he, that is Jesus, sighed deeply in his spirit. And saith, why does this generation seek after a son? Who sighed deeply in their spirit? Jesus himself. So when, when, when we read in these texts about his spirit, that is Jesus' spirit, we clearly understand nobody questions that is Jesus himself. When Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Did he commend his own life himself into the Father? Or some other being, some other person? And himself. himself. All right. So when the Bible says his spirit about Jesus, Jesus spirit is referring to Jesus himself. So a few books later in Galatians 4 verse 6, when Paul tells us, because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son or the spirit of Jesus into your hearts. Who did the father send? Jesus, Jesus himself. So the comforter or the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost or the spirit of Jesus is Jesus himself in spirit form. Right? Very simple, very logical. It is his own life. It is the non-physical, non-tangible aspect of him. Right? We believe that Jesus is, is with us now, but we can't see him, can we? He's not physical. We can't hold with him with our hands. But he is still the same person in spirit form. It's his very own life, his very own presence. As Wolf said in his prayer, Lord, give us the very presence and life and spirit of Jesus. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Paul again here tells us, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is where? In him. Even so, or in like manner, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So in, in here Paul is comparing the relationship between man and his spirit with God and his spirit. He's saying, look, no one knows. What's in the depth of the heart and mind of man except the spirit of man which is in him. And in the same way, even so, no one knows the things of God save the spirit of God. So the relationship between you and your spirit is the same relationship as God and his spirit. Just like your spirit is you. It's not somebody else. When, when the Bible tells us Nebuchadnezzar was troubled in his spirit and his sleep left him, he couldn't sleep. He's the one who was troubled and he's the one who couldn't sleep. Your spirit is you. Same thing, God's spirit is God himself. But notice that when it talks about the spirit of man, it says which is in him. That means it's limited to him. I can't be here with you now and at the same time I'm present with my wife in Queensland, can I? That's a spiritualism. But when it talks about God, it does not limit the spirit of God to God himself. Because God can be in heaven on his throne, but by his spirit, he is with you and me. My spirit is limited to my body. God's spirit is not limited to his body. The Bible tells us, uh, so, so, 
So when the Bible says that the Spirit of God is in you, it is literal. The Spirit of God is in you. Notice, that's exactly what Jesus said, by the way, in John 14, I in you. But notice these verses. Uh, I, I can quote them to save time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, the Bible tells us, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. How many gods? What does the text say? But unto us there is but one God, it is the Father, and how many lords? One Lord, it is Jesus. So when you're talking about, when Paul is talking about the Lord, who is he referring to? Jesus. Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, you can go there, you can go there. Just, just to make sure I'm not misquoting. In 1 Corinthians 8.6, he says, there's one God, it is the Father, there's one Lord, it is Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse, or verse 17 rather, <laughs> Paul tells us, now the Lord, stop for a second. Who is the Lord? Jesus. He said there is one Lord, there is Jesus. Now the Lord is that Spirit. He just plainly told you, Jesus is that Spirit. So are, are we saying that Jesus became a Spirit? That's exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 45. I mean, I'm, I'm sure all these things are all to us, but I want to use them to bring a point. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit or a life-giving spirit. Paul just told you, listen. Jesus was made a life-giving spirit. Jesus is this one Lord, and the one Lord is the Spirit. I mean, He plainly told us that Jesus is the Spirit. He plainly said it. Paul's writing clearly testified to that, that the Holy Spirit or the Comforter or the Spirit of Truth we will receive is Jesus Himself. He tells us that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which dwells in you. And in the same time, come with me to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he said that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. Notice what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse 5. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? He said that your body is a temple to the Holy Spirit which is in you. And he said, don't you know that Jesus Christ is in you? He said that the Lord is that Spirit. He said that Jesus was made a Spirit. Paul cannot make it any clearer that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit you receive, is Jesus Christ Himself. Right? So this is very clear and I think you can see that. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we receive the Comforter, who are we receiving? Jesus Christ Himself. We are receiving His own life, His own spirit. It is Himself. Right? Yep. Yes? That is why Jesus said, Because I live, ye shall live also. My life and your life will be intrinsically linked together in a way that no man can understand. I will be in you. I will live my life in you. Because I live, you shall live also. Notice these verses, again, to, to emphasize the point that Christ is in you. I'll, I'll read them, so to save time, there's about five of them. You can write the references in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. We all know it. Christ in you, the hope of? Glory. Who's in you? Christ. Christ in you. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. He, a person, is in you. Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ, Christ liveth in me. Ephesians 3, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Who is dwelling? Christ. Christ. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We read it earlier. Don't you know that how, how that Jesus Christ is in you? 
in the last verse, Romans chapter 8 verse 10, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. The reason I'm reading these verses is not to bore you, but it is to show you that the Bible is very plain, it's very clear, it is more than one verse that says that Jesus Christ is in you. Jesus Christ is in you. There is more than one verse that says that the Spirit is in you, and then it shows us that the Spirit is Jesus Christ Himself. Yes? Alright. This brings us to the third question. How is all this linked to Jesus' resurrection, glorification, and coming back? Why is it that the Spirit could not be given or was not yet until Jesus is glorified? Why is it that the Comforter could not come until Jesus go to the Father? I want to throw a spanner in the works in here. Now we saw that the Spirit is who? Jesus. And the Spirit was not yet until Jesus was glorified. So in other words, I'm saying that Jesus himself, the life of Jesus, could not be in you until Jesus was glorified, right? Notice this verse, 1 Peter, come with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Whoa, hang on a second, brother. You just said that the Spirit of Jesus, the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, could not be given until Jesus was glorified. That's after the cross. Here we read clearly, the Bible says, the spirit of Jesus was in the prophets of old. You're busted. That's what somebody would say, right? That's what somebody would say, the spirit of Jesus. Okay, this verse clearly tells us that the spirit of Jesus was in the prophets of old. But yet the Bible says, the spirit was not yet until Jesus was glorified. The Bible says, the comforter cannot come unless I go unto you. Are these verses contradicting each other? Or is there something we're missing? Something we're missing. Something we're missing. In order for some to, to uh, take this problem away, what they do is they water these verses down. They say, well, when the Bible says the Spirit was not yet given, all what it's saying is that the Spirit was never given in this measure. It was given before, obviously, because the Spirit of Christ was in the prophets. But it was never given in this big measure like on the day of Pentecost. This is a nice exploration that waters the verse down and makes you harmonize. But that's not what John said. He said the Spirit was not yet. Okay? Jesus said the Comforter cannot come unless I go from my Father. So I don't believe these verses are contradicting themselves, themselves and I don't believe we should water the verse down in order to make it harmonize with our beliefs. In order for us to understand and harmonize them, we have to understand what spirit or life Jesus was talking about when he said you will receive. This particular spirit, as we read in John, is intrinsically linked to his glorification, right? The spirit was not yet because Jesus was not yet glorified so this giving of the spirit is intrinsically linked with his glorification and his glorification is intrinsically linked with his incarnation and work on earth notice this verse come with me to john chapter 17 beginning at verse 4 jesus in here is praying talking to his father and he said i have glorified thee on the earth i have finished the work which thou gavest me to do and now O father Glorify thou me with thine own self, which the glory, with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Jesus said, Lord, I have glorified you on where? On earth. I have finished what? The work which you gave it me to do where? On earth. on earth. And now, because I have glorified you, because I have finished the work on earth, glorify me with your own self. This glorification is intrinsically linked with what Jesus did on earth or with his incarnation. There is a link between the incarnation and glorification and there is a link between the glorification and the giving of the Spirit. So that giving of the Spirit is intrinsically linked with His incarnation. Are you following me? You following what I'm saying? Now, so Jesus is saying, look now Father, because I have done the work, because I have glorified you on the earth, now He is asking to be glorified. As one of us, as one of us, as a man, he finished the work on earth. As one of us, he glorified his father. 
And as one of us, he's asking the Father to glorify him. It's very important to understand that now, as a divine human person, he's asking the Father to glorify him. Prior to the incarnation, was Jesus human? Before the incarnation. Did Jesus take upon himself human flesh before the, he took upon himself human flesh? No. Jesus became the son of man when he was born of Mary. Prior to that, he was fully divine. He was fully God. When he took upon that, he is still fully divine, fully God. But now he is also fully human. Can you see the difference? It's important to understand that the life that now Jesus is asking the Father to glorify is a divine human life which never existed before. Before, there was only the divine life of Christ. Now, there is the divine human life of Christ. This life of Christ that lived in humanity, that was tempted, that was tried, gained the victory, and so on. So what, what, I'm, what I'm bringing over and over again, and I want you to understand, it's very important to understand, is that the humanity of Christ never existed before he took upon himself human flesh. The divine human spirit never existed before Jesus took upon himself human flesh. Right? We know that. This is simple. So now going back to that verse where Jesus said the spirit was not, or rather John said the spirit was not yet. What spirit was he talking about? The divine human spirit which was never in existence prior to the incarnation. The spirit of Christ, the divine spirit of Christ was in the prophets and testified in them. But now the spirit gained upon itself, if I can use this terminology, please forgive me it's, uh, if it's not appropriate. Uh, an experience that never had before. We have to understand something. Prior to the incarnation, the Bible tells us God cannot be tempted. Right? Prior to the incarnation, Jesus could not be tempted. He was grieved with them, yes. But he wasn't tempted with sin. As a human, Jesus could be tempted. And now this life that lived in humanity was tempted with sin and conquered sin in the flesh. This life, Jesus now is coming to the Father and saying, Father, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work. I have conquered sin that you gave me to, to do. And now, glorify me with thy own self. This life Jesus is asking to be glorified is a divine human life that never existed before. Yes? <laughs> it's very important to understand. <clears throat> and on the day of resurrection, if you remember Jesus, when, when he was resurrected, Mary came and she wanted to cling on him, to keep him here. And Jesus said, look, don't touch me or don't cling on to me. Don't delay me here. I have not ascended to my father. I need to go to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. Jesus was, was uh, keen, uh, wanted really, whatever the word is, keen, I guess, to know that his life, his sacrifice was accepted. Yeah. And he went to the father and he came back that afternoon. And what happened in John chapter 20, verse 22? John chapter 20, verse 22. See for yourself. Mm -hmm. And when he said this, he, Jesus, breathed on them, on the disciples, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He, I, I believe he literally breathed. I mean, when John said he breathed on them, he didn't, Jesus didn't stand there and say, I'm breathing on you. No, no. He breathed. John was there. He saw it. And, and he's recording. Wow. He's breathing on us. Wow. He said, Receive ye the Holy Jesus breathed. He went, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Yes. And that was only a deposit too. This was only a deposit. This was only a down payment of what they are to receive not many days hence. Mm -hmm. He told them, wait for the promise. Wait for the promise. On the day of Pentecost, you will receive it. And what happened on the day of Pentecost? The Father anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness above his fellows. In Hebrews chapter 1. Because thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Mm -hmm. He was anointed as the high priest of his people on the day of Pentecost. And just like in, 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 in the type, Aaron in Psalms chapter 133, you can read it for yourself, only three verses. Aaron was anointed with the oil, and then it tells us the oil ran down on his beard and went down to his garment, to his body. 
it was illustrating, typifying what will happen in the future. Jesus as the high priest, he was anointed with oil or with the Holy Spirit, which ran down to his body. Who is his body? The church. We are his body. When Jesus was anointed, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost descended down on his body, on the church. And they received it with power. Right? So this was the glorification that Jesus said, the Spirit was not, John said, the Spirit was not yet because he wasn't yet glorified. The Comforter cannot come because I need to go to my Father. What happened when he went to his Father? He was glorified. Been accepted and, and, and glorified, uh, anointed as the high priest of his people. And now he is able to shed forth what he promised that will come. And which is his very own divine human life that has been glorified and now can come and abide with them. Yes? Beautiful. This harmonizes how Jesus, Spirit of Jesus could be in the prophets of old. Yet John says the Spirit was not yet. Because they're talking about... Almost we can say two different types of spirit or life. The divine spirit of Christ. This is the divine human spirit of Christ. That was tempted, that was tried, that gained the victory. Victorious, that died, that conquered, de conquered sin and conquered death and broke the grave and came out. And Jesus says, here it is. Take it. And another beautiful point of that is because the spirit is shared with Jesus. Yes, we'll, we'll look at that in the, second, in the second time, in the second presentation. You're right. But, but Jesus, be, he was, you know, he, he conquered sin, conquered the grave, conquered death. And he came and he says, here it is. You can have it. And that's why Jesus says, because I live, you will live also. Yeah? Live what life? You will live my life. I will give you my life. I will give you my own presence. That's why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the what? The life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Here on this earth, you are going to receive this eternal life. This very divine human life of Jesus Christ. And you are going to live it on this side of the second coming. Here, right now. This is glorious. What life is Paul talking about that we are going to live and manifest? It is the divine human life of Christ. It is the eternal life. It is the eternal life that we're going to live. Question, when Jesus was on earth, when the disciples handled him and touched him and saw him, what life did Jesus have? He's living a human life. Human life? But what type of life? Come with me to 1 John. A sinless life at the time. 1 John, come with me to 1 John. I want to focus on one aspect of it. So we don't open a, a can of worms and go into that... Uh, Let's stick on this one. First John, yep. chapter 1. Remember, b before you read this, uh, in, in John chapter 1, we all know this. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Go down to verse 14. It says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt amongst us, mm -hmm. and we beheld it. We beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Right? Yes, sure. Keep that in mind as you read. The same author, John, in his first letter, 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our, eye, our hands have handled of the word of life. Who is he talking about? Stop for a second. He's talking about Jesus. Who did they see and handle with their own hands? Who was that from the beginning, which was the beginning? He's talking about Jesus Christ. Right? Notice what he says in verse 2. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was made manifest or was manifested unto us can you see what he's saying in the beginning was the word that which was from the beginning we have seen the word was made flesh and was manifest unto us that which we have seen and handled and was manifested unto us 
In John chapter 1, it says, in him was life. In here, it says, that eternal life which was with the Father was made manifest unto us. We saw it. Who is he talking about? Talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus. And he calls Jesus eternal life. That eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. We have seen it with our own eyes. He's talking about Jesus and he calls him eternal life. Jesus had eternal life. Without going into, into all the implications of it. Mortal life cannot satisfy what was required on the cross. Life of an angel wasn't good enough. Only the eternal divine life. Had to be a divine sacrifice. And John is telling us that eternal life which we have seen, it was in him. And he was that eternal life. So John is very clear what he is talking about. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. Remember John calls Jesus eternal life. Paul in Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 he says, One Christ who is our Life shall appear. One Christ who is what? Jesus Christ himself is our life. Because I live, ye shall live also. That eternal life is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection and the... Lord. Lord. Was he serious? Did he mean what he said? Okay. Is he truly the life? He is our life. He is our eternal life. Because I live, ye shall live also. So let's put all this together, what we've been looking at. Jesus said, when I'm glorified, when I go to the Father, you will receive, his people will receive something or someone they did not have before. Right? Mm -hmm. They will receive the divine human life, which never existed before. This divine human life will be eternal life unto those who believe on Jesus. We also saw that this eternal life is in Jesus Christ. In Him was life, the Bible says. And we also saw that Jesus Christ Himself is our eternal life. And hence, it is Jesus Christ Himself who is dwelling in us. The whole exercise I went through is to show you this one point from Scripture clearly. It is Jesus Christ himself that is living in you and me if you believe on him. And the devil does not want us to know that. And the devil does not want us to know that. John tells us in 1 John chapter 5 verse 11. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath who? Verse 12. He that has the son has life. He that has not the son has not. He's not saying he that has life has life. No. He's not saying he that has power has life. He's not saying he that has words has life. He's saying he that has the Son has life. If you don't have the Son, if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. I, I want you to get this very solid, very clear. If you have the Son, you will have life. If you have a life without the Son, you don't have life. If you have the words of God without the Son, you don't have life. If you have power of God without the Son, you don't have life. He that has the Son. Why? Because life is in Him. Why? Because He is our eternal life. They're inseparable. You cannot separate it, your eternal life from Jesus. Right? In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. So the life that Jesus laid down in humanity on the cross, the divine human life, the victorious divine human life, He takes up again and He gives to humanity. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That very life that Jesus lived, died, conquered sin, conquered the grave and came up, Jesus picks up. And he gives to each and every one of you. That's why John can say, listen, I'm writing these things to you, you who believe on the name of the Son of God, so you can know something. I want you to know, I want you to be sure that you already have eternal life. Why? 
Because you have an eternal being living in you. You have a divine being living in you. Without the physical form, of course. We saw that the spirit is Jesus himself. You have Jesus himself living in you. Who is eternal life? So, I just want to re-echo it again, and again, and again. When you accept Christ, you receive someone from outside of you, someone that you did not have before. You don't only receive life, you don't only receive power, you don't only receive the words of God. No, you receive a being, Jesus Christ himself in spirit form. He comes and lives in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And because you have Christ, he that has the Son has what? Life. Because you have Christ, you have life. So my prayer is that we will grasp it, understand it, believe it, and live it. So that the point, the one focal point I want you to get from this whole message is that Jesus Christ himself is in you.